Hi, um, welcome to this section where we have Caleb Adebayo here. And today he's going to be sharing his experience about studying in the US. Um, so Caleb, how are you doing? Hi, Precious, I'm fine. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, um, so I just wanted to know, why did you decide to study in US? Because there are other countries you could have decided to study. I agree, um, a number of factors. So, first of all and and just putting as a footnote that for people listening to this there are various considerations that come into play when you are trying to decide what to study and i do have i shared most of these things in another um a couple of friends actually shared this in another presentation but these factors for me were very important one was a school that had the program I was looking for. So a school that had energy and environmental law program, which is what my background was in, which is why I was going to do my, my master's. And that was the first thing. And the second thing is that it had to be a school that had a very good reputation. So one of the top schools. So I, I mean, there were a number of schools that were doing the energy and environmental law program, but for me, it also had to be a top school. Now, those were two criteria. Now, another thing was, I wanted it to, I, I wasn't very fascinated by the UK method of schooling, interestingly. So because it would, it would have been the UK or the US for me, but I wasn't very fascinated by, by the method in the UK. One, because it was very similar to what we had in Nigeria. And I felt it was important to explore a different study method. And for those who school in the US, they'll understand what I mean. The way the law program is here, and I'll suspect it's the same for other programs, is a bit different from the way it is in Nigeria, which is what the British handed down to us. Um, that was the first thing. And then the second thing was I had interacted a lot with the US government as uh, a Nigerian in Nigeria. I had been a fellow of the Carantine Youth Fellowship, where I had, which is a US consulate led fellowship. I, I was a fellow for a year. And during the period, I worked with a lot of people from the US government and the Department of State. Then I was also involved in the, the Young um, African Leadership Initiative, which is YALI. I was a YALI fellow. And you know we went to Ghana for about three months, worked with uh, representatives of the YALI program and of the US government. So I had been involved with the US government in a number of things. And I felt like I, will, I had a bit more affinity um, or liking or endearments to the US than I had to the UK. Um, I just wasn't a fan of the UK, unfortunately. So that was also one of the things. And another, th I mean, these, these are all factors. Maybe it might be a factor for some, it might not be important on the wrong for others, but it, it sort of played a role for me. I, I would be lying if I said it didn't. Then while trying to apply, I actually wanted to apply to a couple of UK schools. I don't think I eventually did. Um, but one of the good things was that the US schools had a central uh, portal sort of where you could apply to a number of schools by just paying this one fee and then sending your documents to this one portal and just applying to different schools through that portal. That was an important thing for me because with the UK schools, you had to sort of do it individually and spend different amounts. And, and by the time I calculated it, I'm like, no, I'd rather apply to more US schools and just forget about the UK than do the US and still have to pay the individual fees for the UK. So these were things that at the time I had no idea even about the stay back option because my plan was not to stay back. So I couldn't I couldn't be bothered with that. Um, but for those who are planning to come at this time, because I know that stay back is such an important thing for many people coming, that might be a thing to consider. What are the stay back options and how easy it is to it is it to get you know stay back work visas and, and jobs. Interesting. Thank you. I just want to clarify something because I school in the UK. You don't have to like pay application fee to all the universities. Like for me, I didn't pay any application fee to my university. And also, like, even if there's an application fee, you could always ask for a waiver and sometimes they give it to you. So UK is not that bad. <laughs> I do agree. There are schools that I saw that I, I would have, I would not need to pay application fee to apply. But I didn't just want those schools. So that was the problem. The schools I wanted, I had to pay. The schools I didn't want, I didn't have to pay. I'm like, nah, just forget it. All right. But certainly, I know that. 
No, it's fine. No, I mean, I, th I can see definitely you're enjoying staying in the US, like you said, like the stay back option. So how easy was it for you to like stay back and to start working like after graduating in the US? Yeah. Honestly, I, I would not use my story as a template. It would be, um, which is why I, I do have this video on my, it was a program we held for people coming out of the law school, I think two years ago. And we have the video, there are about eight to 10 speakers. There were two sessions. So I think a total of about 15 or more speakers um, who were doing their master's programs, LLMs now, or had just finished across different parts of the world, Europe, the UK, the US, uh, who came to share perspectives on you know, things like stay back options, right? So, you know, if somebody can watch that, that will give them a, a broader view because my story is, I will call it an outlier story. It is not the everyday base case for everyone who plans to school in the US. Now for me, like I said, I was not planning to stay back. There was no consideration for staying back. For me, it was to come do my master's, spend the extra year on the visa, working and getting foreign, getting foreign work experience and returning to my country to do what it is I, I, I was doing, but to even do it at a better and, and larger scale. Because for me, that was the reason why I came to my master's. Now, it, it then happened that, you know, the way God pivoted my journey was in a, an entirely different direction. Um, so stay back is not so easy for the international student who's studying in the U.S. because there is something called the work visa, which is um, the H-1B, as some people know it. Now, what happens is that when you come on your student visa, you are not allowed to work outside the regular school. You know, have some most of the time, 20 hours work, you're allowed to do maybe 30 hours during the summer. Uh, you can only work with school institutions. Now, post your study, you are allowed to do, um, you know, full-time regular work, right? It's You get on something called OPT, which is the optional practical training. It's typically for a year, but for people in STEM fields, they give them up to two years and they can extend. Now, the thing about that is that after, so for LLMs, it's, it's one year because it's not, our program is not STEM. Now, after the OPT, you are required to get a work visa because you can no longer work in the US after that one year without a work visa. Now, the work visa is not something that comes as a right or simply because you have gotten a job from an employer. It in fact comes through a lottery. It's a lottery process. And the numbers are very limited. I hear that this last year they gave out only eight, the last one, it happens every March, they give out only 85,000 slots, right? And they had over um, about 700,000 people who applied. So the percentage of people who get the, the H-1B visa compared to the percentage that apply is very, very small. Now that creates a problem for the international students coming to school in the US. The question is, do I come and hope that I am part of those that small coterie of people who get the H-1B or do I just not come and go to another country? Some people take the easier route and just go to the UK because again, the UK, if you, I don't know if you know this, but a couple of years before, they weren't as open as they are now. The UK had terrible stay back options. In fact, once you're done, they would send you back to your country. It was like, finish and go back. It was recently, especially with Brexit and everything, and they realized that they were no longer having the kind of population in terms of work population they used to have. They then started opening open themselves up to these other countries and saying, you know what, we're ready to have you stay back. And also had this uh, education related visa where if you schooled in a certain school or certain schools on a list, you can directly apply for a visa to work there in the, US, in the UK. So you can see how these guys are changing their immigration laws in respect to what is happening. The US hasn't changed and it's it's still that difficult. So most people will just choose, okay, the UK makes more sense or Europe makes more sense or even Canada makes more sense, right? But others will still come to the US. Again, US schools seem to have more, not seem, US schools do have more funding. In terms of funding, the most funding comes from US schools, you will not get it anywhere else. So many people just say, you know what, they're giving me the funding, I'm just gonna come and let's see how it plays out. Whatever happens, happens, and I hope I'll get a job. Now, there are other alternatives in terms of work, um, visas for work. For instance, if you do get a job, now I'm not an immigration lawyer, but these are things I've got to know over time and I'm choosing to share. Now, if you do get a job with a nonprofit, for instance, or um, a school affiliated institution, or a church, for instance, or missions, or, 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 or a, a faith based organization, those guys do not have to get into the lottery pool 
So as long as they choose to file the, the H-1B for you, you are, or the R-1 sometimes in terms of the religious organizations, you are assured of getting your visa. You do, you do not need to get into a pool. But the thing is, you can't do that and then say, um, after a couple of, you know, after working with that visa for a year, you now want to go to a private sector organization. You would have to get into the pool path, right? But um, these are some of the things people don't know. And sometimes when they know, it also helps them to say, you know what, I'm happy. I want to work for a nonprofit organization in any event. Or if you're working for the UN or the IFC or the World Bank, you're going to be on a different visa, which is a G visa. And, and that visa does not also have to go into the pool. So these are some of the things that also make people say, you know what, I will come regardless. And I would hope that things work out either way. There's also the EB1, EB2 visas. An immigration lawyer, I will tell you some more about it. They are specialized visas that, you know, not everyone applies for because the criteria is very demanding. But um, yes, that's that's how it is. For me, I I was favored. That's the story, right? I got the job. They put in for me for the visa. I got the visa. It's not everyone's story, which is why I just you know tend to tell people don't use my story as a template. It's a great story to draw inspiration from. It's a great story to say, God, you did it for this person. You can do it for me, but. It shouldn't be that, oh, because it happened like this for this person, I expect it will happen for me. It's good you have all the facts. Thank you so much for sharing and congratulations for your visa. So I know that um, you went self-funded yeah, for your master's degree. So um, could you like share tips for someone who is thinking, oh, probably they don't have funding opportunity, no scholarship, nothing, but they are determined just like you to still push forward to go for their studies. So like based on your experience, like how did you do it and what advice would you give to someone who's trying to like raise funds for their studies? Okay, I, I call my funding God funded. I was I was God funded to school because it's true that that is just it. Um, I didn't, I got a partial scholarship, which wasn't going to go anywhere. And when could you compare it to the full tuition price? And I decided to crowdfund. And God was faithful to me. I raised about 20 something thousand for my crowdfunding, uh, 20 some thousand US dollars. I can't remember the exact amount now. Um, from the crowdfunding that I did during the crowdfunding period. And then God used a very wonderful woman who had no reason to do it for me to give me $10,000. So that added to the 20, 20 something thousand. So th that is why I say I was God funded because I truly was. Now, the good thing is that I was able to, with everything I gathered, pay for my first semester fees. And because it's a one year program, NYU does allow you to pay for one semester. And as long as you paid for the first semester, you can do the next semester. And if it's a one year program, right? If it's more than one year, you can only apply that to the last semester of your program. But if you're it's a one year program of two semesters, once you're paid for the first semester, you're allowed to register for the second semester and in fact, finish it without being troubled for the fees, as long as, you know, first semester has been paid. And then you can decide to pay the, the second semester fees after you have graduated. The only thing is that you don't get your diploma until you're done with the payment, but it doesn't stop you, you know, accessing jobs or getting your transcript or anything. So that is one of the wonderful things about, I, I don't know if it's just NYU or generally US schools. I don't know that this applies in the UK. I've had a number of people reach out from the UK. And now this is not this to the UK, but I'm just trying to, to, to state the difference there. I had a number of people reach out to say, oh, I mean, my first semester, and if I don't pay this fees before this date, I won't be able to finish. And I'm like, oh, wow, and you've paid the first semester. And they're like, yes, you, you know, um, this is not the case with, with NYU. And it's, it's such a blessing because without that, I don't know that I would have been able to attend right? Because I couldn't raise loans during the period. I couldn't take loans rather because of, of COVID, right? That was what in fact led me to do the crowdfunding. And so um, after, the, so, so having paid for the first semester, it was now the second semester that I could not, did not pay for. Of course, the, the scholarship was divided into two parts, first and second. But in terms of paying for the second semester, I couldn't do that. And then thankfully, by God's special grace, I got a job before I graduated. So that as soon as I graduated, I then entered into a payment plan and started paying the university. Now, that is my funding story. The crowdfunding took grit, courage, um, 
the death of shame and God's tremendous, tremendous grace and favor. How do you come to people in a in in a, in during COVID, the heart of COVID, right? A pandemic and a recession, because I remember very clearly that in the middle of November, Nigeria declared a recession while I was going to my car and I think I was just about 15 days in or so. And in the middle of that, God was so, so generous to me that he caused you the hearts of people to just, um, you know, hand, hand out money, uh, regardless of the fact that some of them did not know me. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I'll say. I'll say that with the crowdfunding, you need to know that it's what you want to do. You need to be ready to kill every iota of shame in you because people said stuff. I promise you they did. People that are even friends were like, bro, do you know how much you want to raise? This is not a small amount. I don't, I, I love you, but I'm sorry. This is not, I don't subscribe to this. And somewhere like, I can't share it because it's not the kind of thing I share on my page. And, you know, they are friends, but you could understand why they would say so. Right. So it, it's a period that you needed, you need people, which is why I advise people to reach out to me to say they want to do craft on them. Like you need a set of people, you need a team. You can't do it alone. Right. You need a team that is going to constantly help you doing it day to day. You need a plan. You need courage. It takes a lot of courage, a lot of humbling yourself. There's admitting that you are nothing, that you're coming to the world to say, I cannot afford this and I need your help. And um, that's pretty much what, you, what you're, you'll be doing. So um, I don't know if there are specific questions of a crowdfunding you want to ask, but that was really how I was able to pay my way through NYU. Yeah, yeah. I know when you were crowdfunding, and even with the link, because I even remember also like sharing yeah, the link. But then to say, like you said, you had like people that were just there to like know that okay this is like not like me like okay i'll just share once in a while but like this is it we are really raising money for caleb so like how do you form that circle of people to say tomorrow in case someone might like you know what let me also try like caleb but i don't have maybe that network or people that can push my campaigns for me so how do you think they can like build that okay so social capital is a thing and for anyone who, whether or not you think you're going to crowdfund in the future, I think it's important to start building social capital. Because as much as, and this is something people point out to me from time to time, you know, when I even share the testimony, as much as God was good to me, and I don't know if you, you listened to somebody I, I, I respect so much, Apostle Salman, who teaches a lot on, you know, favor and the place of people um, and honor and just value. It's the fact that, you need to build your social capital, right? It's fine that you don't have them now, but you just need to start investing in relationships and in people and in adding value because that is what people will refer to, right? I know that during the period of my crowdfunding, I sought to share stories every day and the stories related to things I had done in the past, some of which I had even forgotten, but that period was, you know, maybe to start digging in the things I'd done through my organization, my nonprofit, Earth Plus, things I'd done personally, you know, during the current youth fellowship, just things I had committed and, and, uh, and contributed to my society and to people and to just life generally. That value that I added. Now, some of it, it was being shared to people who did not know me, but some of it was being shared by the people who knew me and were part of that team I had created. And because they knew me, I mean, I know that there was a time that there were people who reached out to one of the person on my persons on my team and said, you do not know Caleb has a team. In fact, I think one of them was like, does Caleb have a team? We want to join it. And then one of them discovered like, we didn't know Caleb had a team that was in, I want to be part of it. Like, let me join in this thing, right? And that is what social capital is. How you're able to so be beneficial or, you know, have these tremendous relationships, these relationships where you have added value to the lives of people that they are able to say, we want to add value to you as well. We can't, maybe we cannot provide all the money you need, but we want to constantly share this thing. And then something I did during the period was also to shoot a video. It was also one of the people, you know, who advised one of the people on my team, which, which is, you know, again, points to the value of having teams of, you know, people that strong relationships. And he told me, if you do this video, it will, it will help people and it will add value to what you're doing. And I did the video. The video is still up to today. And if you watch the video, you see where at the end I'm saying, you know, if you have to, if you could donate to, I mean, it's, it's way past that, but 
it was a funny thing that, because I reshared the video during every period that is application season, like probably in the next month or so, I'll reshare it again on my LinkedIn, is that last year, you know, of course, by this time I had started working on everything. I just saw an alert in my Nigerian account. I was like, what is this alert for? And I, I saw something like, um, get killer to NYU as the narration. And I'm like, wow, somebody went to watch that video and still saw it fit to send money. It was a small amount, but it, it meant a lot. It meant a lot that people understand value. The video was, I spent money doing that video. I was looking for money and I spent money. Go watch it. You see that the video was shot by a professional. Thankfully, it was this, this my friend's friend in his network that, you know, he just talked to him. The guy agreed, you know, we got down to it. I paid him money for it. It, it was money I needed, but I was like, oh, well. And I told my story and the story was how to help people get into top schools, right? I was sharing what I knew. And by the time I shared it, people still watching, watching. And then they were, it was, it was such a helpful thing and a blessing to them. And it continues to remain a blessing. So what would I say to people who do not have, I want to go do something like this is, start talking, first of all, know that you need to build social capital beyond crowdfunding. So start investing in your relationships, that's number one. But then since at this time you don't have those relationships, you want to use whatever relationships you have. If it's one, two people, you want to reach out to them. You want to say, um, this is what I want to do, could you help me? Now, because the truth is you would have some relationships in your life. The only thing is that you may not have been watering them, you may not have been you know, engaging them, utilizing them very well, but you need to start um, making use of the ones you have, no matter how small the circle is to say, this is what I want to do. Can you help me? Because you can't do crowdfunding on your own. You will fail. I promise you, it is not a one-man job because it's not about even the sharing because, I mean, people who are good at Twitter can use one app and open five Twitter accounts and do what they want to do. But it's about the mental strength. It is a tough thing to do. It is tough to wake up in the morning and see the account for your crowdfunding is still at the same needle for five days. What makes you move on? Where do you get the energy to move on? And it's a, it, people, I mean, the advice is that you need to keep your crowdfunding to a specific time so it doesn't lose its efficacy. So if you're doing a 60 day or 30 day or whatever, 50 day crowdfunding, every day that passes is a day that money, that money is not entering, is a day that has gone and that cannot be recovered. So how do you keep up that energy? How do you keep up, keep up the faith? You need people who are constantly saying, Caleb, let's do this, do this. Have you done this? We need to do this. Because I have people around me who are like, I can't share this thing on my state, on my timeline because I, I really don't share such things. But this and this and this and this, have you done this? Have you done this? Have you reached out to this? I think you could do this. I think you could do the helpful things, right? So even if you have two people, utilize them. And then from there, begin to promise yourself that you will build social capital and beyond you know, just having people around you add value to lives. I've told people that you don't need to be the biggest thing in the world to have a mentee. You don't. Like, as much as you've achieved something that someone else in the world hasn't, you can teach someone. And that is how life moves on. You need to teach and be taught. So have people above you that you're learning from and have people that you are teaching. If you are somebody that neither learns or teaches, you have a problem. If you're somebody that does not, that learns, but never teaches, you're like, oh yes, you acquire from me, acquire from here, you have friends, you're, but you don't have anyone that you're methodically putting and pouring into. It is a problem because what maintains a fresh body of water is that it is giving out and it is taking in. So we need to understand that value is, people, people would always reward value. So what value are you giving? Are you volunteering in your community? Or it's just chop life, you want to make money and chop life. And that's, that's your goal in life. Yes, it's good, but at the time where that money cannot work for you, you will need people. So how are you helping people through the things and the questions that they have in their lives? So it's something that, you know, as a person, you need to start looking at and saying, why will people help me? What, what is the story I'm telling? Because for me, it was a storytelling game. Each day I have a story to tell. What is the story I'm telling? It's not just coming out to say, oh, support me. So, yeah, people want to support, but why would I support? It's really for those who do not particularly know me. You know, someone somewhere, one thing I learned during the crowdfunding was that someone somewhere had heard about me from someone somewhere. It's like, well, I don't know the guy, but he seems like a serious guy. I've heard about him from this person. And, you know, he seems like someone I can see the stories and the things he's sharing. And, well, I'll just keep something. That is it. So I don't know if I've answered it or we still have more questions. I know I've spoken a lot. 
Yeah, no, that's okay. Because I won't want to like stretch you because we have like a limited time. But I'm just curious to know, like, like what inspires you? Like what kept you to keep pushing despite the whole, I think it's, it's, it's a very exhausting process. <laughs> yeah, it's not. yeah. So what inspires you? Yeah. Yes. Um, what inspired me to keep pushing? I'd say God and the people around me. I think those are the two things. Um, the fact that there are people who are willing to support me. How do you stop doing something when there are people around you that are doing it for you? You're like, well, I want to stop, but if you are there and you're there, I might as well go on, right? Um, two, you know, God just being on my side and constantly speaking words to me in church and through my personal time with him. And I knew that, okay, you know, yeah, God's got me either way. And just, um, so yeah, which is why relationships are important, friends are important. So they just keep you going. And God is important because ultimately you fall back to him regardless of what happens. And just knowing that this is the path that God has set you on, that part is important because if, if not, because there are days you won't see anything. How do you keep the faith? It's knowing that God, you are in this with me. We talked about this. So help me. I need your help in this. And it just keeps you moving. There's really nothing else that can keep you moving because there are days that you will not see anything. There are days that you would hear people say stuff, either directly or through third parties. There are, I mean, I heard things. I promise you, I heard things. People who said, why is he, doesn't he, you know, can't he go and do masters in um, one university in Ocean State? Why does he want to go and do abroad? And if he wants to let him find money, and some said, didn't he know the price of the university before he applied? You know, all those things. And then you see it and you're like, wow, you know, um, but oh well, God was really faithful. So I'd say, yeah, those are, those are the two things that kept me solid during the period. Nice thing. Um, so any plans for the future? Like, what are you thinking of doing this? The future in yeah. terms of term, short term, medium term. Yeah, big goals. Anything you feel like sharing, no pressure. Like <laughs> okay, so um in terms of the future, I in terms of place, and this is something I always tell my I've told my fiance since the very day we started, you know, preparing to dates is because she, you know, it's a question she asked me and I tell everyone who bothers to ask that in terms of place, I'm just going to be wherever God wants me to be because the story of Isaac is the fact that in a land where there was famine, he sowed and he reaped a hundredfold. How do you sow in a land where there is famine and reap a hundredfold? when others are saying this land is not good for us. It's about going where God asks you to. And I keep telling people that Egypt, as, as bad as Egypt was represented in scripture, when it comes to God saying, don't go down to Egypt, in many instances, God by his, himself sent Joseph to Egypt. By his own hand, he carried Joseph to Egypt. Why, you would ask? Why take Joseph to a place where you are telling others not to go to? Because when God takes you to a place, he has a purpose for you there. And so if you decide and say, because Joseph went to Egypt, okay, well, all the rest of us, is that Egypt will go? You're making a big mistake because that's not where God is asking you to go. God will ask you and decide where you will go. And he might tell others that that is not the place for them. So if God is saying, hey, like, about the next five, 10 years, I want you here. I'll be here. I'm here right now because he wants me here. And I, I, can, I can tell you signs and things that I know that it's, I'm certain that he wants me here. And if he says, go back or go to another place, I'm, I'm also happy to approve myself and leave. And I'm happy my fiance shares that view. So it, it's, not, it's not a subject of argument in the future. Now, in terms of uh, job prospects and career, I mean, I, my, my long-term plan is to do something that affects not just Nigeria, but Africa. And it's still going to be within the space of energy and environmental um, issues, but, but coming from the aspect of finance, which is why I believe God led me down the path I am, just financing um, the energy transition largely in Africa, in Latin America, and the developing world, essentially. And I know that that's, it, that's in the long term, that is something I'm definitely going to be doing and be involved in. And yeah, so that's, that's the plan. Just leave, love God, get married, 
have amazing kids, um, raise them in the fear of the Lord, do the will of God, and just affect lives, really affect lives through the work of God. I feel like God has blessed me a lot, and it, it's my duty to bless as many people as possible with what God has blessed me with. Thank you. Like, you're amazing and so inspiring. And I like that you always draw from faith. Like, you carry your faith. Like, I think that he's posting, he has got there. I'm like, wow, that's interesting. So if people want to reach you, um, how can they reach you? Like, maybe someone just wants to connect with you. Oh, I'm, I'm always available on LinkedIn. Um, always available on LinkedIn. I am there as, as the easiest place to reach me. So just please reach out to me there, send me a message. I reply messages. It might take a while because I have a number of people reaching out. Um, so I do reply, but please do not, LinkedIn etiquette, please go straight to the point. Don't start with hi, and then expect me to say hi back. And then you say, how are you? And then I expect to say, I'm fine. How are you to know? Just, just put everything in one message. So it's easy to communicate, right? Um, but yeah, I'm always available on LinkedIn. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that is it. Even me too. I don't like, if someone starts saying hi, hello, I don't respond. Just type once and say everything. So I know exactly what you want. And let's just take it up from there. Kelly, thank you so much for like sparing time this evening to like share your story. You are welcome. No problem. Yeah, and I wish you the best. And we still keep in touch. So thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye.